This video is part of the Commercial Building Electrical Design Series. Uh, we're dealing with power distribution design. We're continuing our review of some of the basic materials used, and this time we are looking at cables and cords. So to show where we are in the progression of things, we've covered the delivery system, and now we're getting into materials. We looked at the at wire last time, and now we're extending that into cables and cords. So there are a couple of ways to install wires in a distribution system to form circuits to supply various loads in an electrical system. One of the ways to physically install these wires is in the form of cables or cords. So in most commercial and industrial installations, though, cables and cords are generally not used to run the main permanent portion of the circuit from the distribution panel to the load location. Cables and cords are generally used to make final connections to equipment and devices to allow for motion or vibration in the equipment. There are some instances where cable use uh, is increased in an attempt to save money, but this is usually only done as a last resort to help a project come in budget. Uh, so now we want to examine some of the cables and cord assemblies that may be used for these installations. One of the first ones we want to talk about is non-metallic cable. Uh, this is referred to as NM cable, or abbreviated as NM cable. Uh, this cable is an assembly of conductors combined and covered in a non-metallic jacket, as shown in the picture on the right here, that may be used uh, to limit, may be used in limited construction types to run branch circuits. So the use of this type of cable is governed by Article NEC Article 334. NM cable is specified in terms of size and individual conductors and the number of conductors in the assembly. So for example, if you have 12 3 NM cable, this has a quantity of three number 12 conductors and a paper wrapped bare grounding conductor. So you can see the, the grounding conductor up here. So this type of cable is often referred to as Romex. That's the slang term for this or a trade name. Uh, and, this, and the history behind that is that it was originally sold by Rome Cable Corporation in Rome, New York in 1936. So this is the route for the name Romex. As far as where the X part comes from, uh, I have not ever heard a story about that. I guess it's just a, a slang, word, slang version of Rome, so Rome Cable. So this type of cable is primarily used in residential construction. We almost never use this uh, in commercial construction and in many instances it's not approved for commercial applications. So you need to be wary, wary of that, but know that it's out there. Uh, next, we want to look at armored cable, which is uh, many times referred to as AC cable. This is an assembly that consists of individually insulated conductors along with a metallic bond wire uh, that are paper wrapped and bundled together and wrapped with a flexible metallic armor. Uh, as shown here in this picture below. Uh, the use of this type of cable is governed by Article 320 of the National Electrical Code. And the allowed uses of this type of cable is probably more than NM cable, which we just looked at, but typically more restricted than type MC cable, which we'll look at next. So in many regions, this and sometimes MC cable, which we're about to look at, uh, may be referred to by electricians, especially as BX. So if you hear I'm talking about BX, they're either talking about AC or MC cable. Uh, but this term is not, or this, this abbreviation is not recognized by the National Electrical Code, so just be aware of that. Next, we want to look at metal clad cable. This is referred to as MC cable. Uh, it's an assembly that consists of individu individually uh, insulated conductors and a grounding conductor that are bundled together and wrapped with an interlocked metallic armor as shown below. So the use of this type of cable is governed by NAC Article 330. So the allowable use of this type of cable is generally more than type NM or AC cable. Uh, but again, as with AC cable, uh, this is also referred to as BX. So you'll hear electricians refer to BX and this is what they're talking about. Interestingly enough, MC cable is often allowed in more applications than AC cable. AC cable is more restricted and um, for different applications it is not allowed. I'll be honest with you, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. From what I've been told uh, or what has been explained to me, the main difference is how the 
metallic sheath is installed that it's more intric intricately interlocked for MC cable whereas AC cable is more just wrapped uh, so I guess it can come apart I, I don't know I mean I've held both in my hands before and had a hard time telling them apart but uh, just be aware of that another type of cable that you may run into but not nearly as often as the other types is minerally insulated cable or MI cable and so this is an assembly that consists of individual conductors that are insulated by magnesium oxide and protected by an outer metal sheath as shown below so here you have your magnesium oxide substance uh, insulating the conductor and then you have an outer sheath that's uh, metallic so the use of this type of cable is governed by NEC article 332 so because of its unique protection uh, this cable because of the unique protection this cable offers uh, it is allowed in many types of applications such as hazardous locations uh, in, in cable tray and just all types of things um, but uh, where you might see it the most is many times it's used on fire pumps they'll use this uh, to supply fire pumps because it is so rugged and it is heavily protected and it is fireproof and so uh, many uh, jurisdictions will ask for MI cable to be run to the fire pump So some other cables, there's many types of cables out there, but you know, some that you know, we want to talk about that uh, at least let you hear about them. These are probably more residential in nature. Um, one is TC or tray cable. This one isn't residential, actually. It's, it's regulated by Article 336. You might see this in industrial applications. So if they're running a lot of the power and cable tray out to um, assembly line motors and assembly line loads a lot of times they'll use tray cable and so you need to be sure and be familiar with article 336 if you're going to install that uh, another is use or just se and so the se is service entrance rated use is underground service entrance rated so the use many times will be direct burial uh, and it's used for uh, supplying services to houses se is usually more used for service drop to a weather head uh, but again, these are governed in Article 338 in the National Electrical Code. And then finally, one that uh, you might hear, especially if you do any residential work, is called URD, and that stands for Underground Residential Distribution. This is not a NEC recognized designation for cable. So, uh, although many power companies will use what they call URD cable, this is not you know, accepted by the National Electrical Code. But what you can do is if you look at what they're calling URD cable, many times it is an assembly of other cables like THHN or XHHW or something like that. So you can take the rating of those, but to say URD is, you know, what's it rated for? Uh, there's really no such thing as far as the National Electrical Code is concerned. Uh, so the second, the, the bottom two, USE, SE, and URD usually come in the form of single duplex, triplex. And so if you hear people talking about triplex or duplex, this is what this is. So it just means um, they are combined kind of in an assembly uh, on one spool where you can pull all this one time. And usually you'll have the neutral or ground conductor, which will be bare, and then your phase conductors, which will have the insulation on them. So I did want to mention briefly medium voltage cable. Now this is usually outside the scope of the electrical building uh, design because we usually take it once it's stepped down to our uh, user voltage like we talked about earlier, but uh, there may be instances where we have to do some medium voltage work. And so we want to look at the type of cables that are used in this. And there's two that are probably the most commonly used. And they are XLP, which is cross length polyethylene, or you'll hear it referred to as XLPE. And the other is EPR, which is ethylene propylene rubber cable. Um, again, I see both of these pretty regularly in industry. Uh, these two types of cables are very similar, with EPR being slightly more flexible and it does have a reduced thermal expansion relative to XLP type cables, but uh, XLP. Uh, does seem to have an improved mechanical properties, especially at elevated temperatures. So you kind of need to know what environment you're using it in to help you pick which one you might want to use, but usually they're interchangeable. Um, one thing to note though is these specialty types of cables 
are usually required at higher voltages to manage the high field strengths pro produced by higher voltage transmission. Uh, so this usually requires some type of semiconductor material to help dissipate these fields. And so the problem with that is, is that uh, up to about a thousand volts air is a pretty good insulator, right? So your electricity usually doesn't want to jump off and travel through air. But if you get the voltage high enough, and this can occur anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 volts, and it depends on humidity and a few other factors, um, the air can start to ionize. And so when it does, you can have leakage current, and then it's to, you know, to a point to where you know, if, you have a, if you're close enough to another conducting surface, you can arc. So the air will not always be a good, uh, good insulator. So when you have these medium voltage cables that are anywhere from five to 15,000 volts usually, uh, you run the risk of, you know, they set up a pretty strong electric field around the, around the conductor, so you do run the risk of ionizing the air and having it arc over. So we use the semiconductor layers and strategies to help dissipate those fields. So I just want to take a quick look at EPR and XLP cable. You can see these are pretty built up compared to our previous uh, lower voltage uh, wiring cable that we've looked at. And so you have the conductor, conductor screen, your XLP insulation, which is kind of like the mineral in, minerally insulated cable. Uh, you'll have an uh, insulation screen. You'll have some of that semiconducting tape, which I talked about to help dissipate the field. And then they usually have some kind of aluminum sheath. Um, <clears throat> over here on the EPR side, you, you see it's similar, but you have the the semiconducting layer and the EPR insulation, copper tape shield, and just and then just a PVC jacket, not a metallic. You know, you can see it either way, but uh, you can see this stuff's pretty heavy duty and it can be tough to work with. So one other thing worth noting is, uh, you know, with smaller wires, you usually just strip them right and stick them under a terminal and, and screw down the terminal and it's connected. It's not that quite that simple with medium voltage cable. Uh, because of the nature of what we're doing with the fields and the buildup and the semiconductor layers and stuff like that, we have to have a, a little bit more built-up connector that we put on there, and we call this a stress cone. So if you see these, these are referred to as stress cones, and it has to do with the electrical stress, uh, high-voltage stress control tube you see here. And so, you know, it's a, it's a it's a little bit of an involved process to terminate these things. So, you know, your electrician needs to be familiar with how to do that. And it is a little more labor intensive. Uh, you can also use, uh, or it's common to see these, what are called load break elbows, uh, same type of thing. It's kind of a stress cone built up in here. And then um, you can use this to plug and unplug to a connector. And we'll look at how that's done on the next, uh, next slide here. So here we see that, uh, a load break elbow again and you might see these out uh, actually I see these out every time I go driving around these are cable tap enclosures and so the power company will use these to divide up their circuits and run them in different locations and they'll use these load break elbows and they call them load break elbows because you can technically pull them off under load uh, you usually want to use a shotgun hot stick which is uh, looks something like this and those usually extend out they're telescopic and we'll go out to like 30 or 40 feet to make sure there's plenty of clearance in case something arcs. Uh, they use these in uh, pad mount transformers too to kill the power in those, so you might see those. And then they'll also use them for air switches up on top of poles, so you can see an air switch up here, and they'll use the, the hot, shotgun hot stick to, 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 uh, to open and close them. But here you see the installation of some stress cones on a pole-mounted assembly. And so, uh, but you can see them in transformers as well, or switch gear. They use the stress cones uh, anywhere that are terminating the medium voltage cable. One thing worth noting is that when medium voltage cable is installed, since the insulation system is so critical, as we discussed, uh, that it must be tested after installation to ensure uh, no damage occurred during the installation. Um, this is accomplished by performing a high pot test, which is Basically, basically applying a very high voltage or potential to the non-connected conductor and measuring if there is any leakage flow or leakage current flow uh, from the conductor through the insulation itself. Any leakage current uh, could or would indicate a compromise or damage in the insulation, which could later be catastrophic under normal operating conditions. Uh, you know, it could arc in the conduit or in the gear itself. 
So if there is a significant leakage current during the high pot test, then the cable must be uh, usually replaced in its entirety. Interestingly enough, high pot testing can be done using either AC or DC voltages. So DC testing allows for a much lower trip value for the leakage current. So this may allow the user to identify potential issues uh, that may not be evident using the AC voltages. Also, DC voltages can be applied gradually. You can ramp them up slowly, uh, which can allow for uh, issues to be discovered before actual insulation breakdown occurs. So you may be able to, to remedy uh, an insulation issue or help build it up or something without destroying or, or harming the cable. A uh, disadvantage of the DC high pot is that the equipment is generally more expensive than AC equipment. So while AC is less expensive, it does run a higher risk of harmful, harmful discharging or harmful arcing uh, during testing than DC does. So now we want to turn our attention to cords. We've looked at cables, but um, when we talk about cords, this is a more flexible and traditional method of installing or using wire in an installation to make final connections to equipment. Uh, it's in, in, and we do this in the form of a cord. So the use of these assemblies is governed by NEC Article 400. Uh, these are assemblies of insulated wire that are grouped together and bound by an additional external material that again provides maximum flexibility and possibly protection from moisture or oil or both. While these cords are typically sold in the form of reels as shown, the final insta installation is usually in the form of a custom length cord uh, with an approximately, with an appropriately, excuse me, appropriately uh, NEMA sized male or female cord cap. So this is a cord cap here. Um, and so we usually install this on one or both ends to help facilitate the use of the cord so that you can plug it in and out. So, uh, you know, you might make these for welders or for other uh, equipment that you'd use in a shop or uh, you can do it for generators or, or any types of things. So usually I have this cord, you roll it off, strip the wires, put them in the cord cap, and, you know, get the matching cord cap, whatever you're plugging it into. So the characteristics of these types of cords is identified by the code letter given on, on the cord. So if you look on the, on the cord itself along the insulation, the external insulation, I usually have stamped on there uh, these designating codes. And so these are defined in NEC table 400.4. So some of the more common letters or definitions you might see are these. So if, it's a, if there's a C in it, it's usually for a lamp cord. Uh, G would be for a, a portable power cable. Um, EV is a new one, electrical vehicle cable. Uh, you know, you, one that, a general type of cord that you'll see a lot, you know, here electricians refer to as SO cord. So SO cord means it's uh, S is service cord, O means it's oil resistant or outside jacket. Um, the S means it's rated up to 600 volts, but if you're in a 208 volt system, you might just need an SJ cord. So you could have like an SJ00. That's another common uh, combination. So that means it's good for up to 300 volts and it's oil resistant inside insulation and outside jacket uh, or an SJOW. Uh, you know, it's weather, water resistant. So you, you'll see many combinations here for these types of cords. Uh, the final category I want to just touch on is bare conductors. So for the special case of grounding conductor, it is, conductors, it is allowable to use bare aluminum or bare copper conductors. That is conductors with no insulation at all. That's just like we see here. Um, so the use of these types of conductors is governed in NAC Article 250 which would be just for grounding. So these conductors are still provided in different sizes as with insulated conductors, but they may only be used as grounding conductors or in grounding systems such as lightning protection and electrical building system. So they are permitted to be used as energized phase conductors in transmission and distribution applications when they run overhead, you know, on power poles, but uh, we should never use them for that in any electrical building application.